Hello and welcome to The Rules of Investing, brought to you by Livewire Markets. I'm your host, David Thornton. We're constantly told that diversification is the only free lunch in finance. Yet, most of the world's top investors choose not to eat it. Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, Lou Simpson, George Soros, they all run concentrated portfolios. Today's guest on The Rules of Investing is similarly esteemed a similarly concentrated portfolio. Claremont Global's Bob Desmond runs a portfolio of just 10 to 15 quality growth stocks. Many of the stocks he owned during the free money period of high liquidity and high growth are the same stocks he owns today. In today's episode, Bob explains why quality growth is the best strategy in all markets, why investors shouldn't react to the news cycle, why NVIDIA might not be overpriced despite its enormous run of late, and the one stock he would love to own forever. And now a word from our sponsor. Research shows that experienced investors are looking for an edge. As the first ever sponsor of LiveWire's Rules of Investing podcast, Bell Direct is offering exclusive access to three current Bell Potter stock reports every week for a limited time and the chance to win a share of 3 million Velocity Frequent Fly points, which we will explain at the end of this podcast. Bob Desmond, welcome back on The Rules of Investing. Thanks, David. Good to see you. A lot's changed since we last spoke in October last year. What surprised you the most? Um, Well, that's an interesting question. I I think markets are always a surprise, to be honest. Uh, The future is always uncertain. You don't know what's coming. So I think it, it is always a surprise. I, I, I'm not, um, I suppose we, last time we spoke, we were pretty bullish and just, to, just because the valuations looked so attractive this time last year. So I guess the surprise has been how quickly the markets have, have kind of bounced, uh, as it were. I mean, there was, last time we met, was, everyone was negative, everyone was bearish. Um, recession was definitely coming. Um, every cab driver told me a recession was coming. It was obvious. Um, the recession hasn't come yet. And suddenly the narrative now is we've achieved a soft landing. So that's that's a surprise. But the markets are always a surprise. You recently said in a piece on Livewire that you're wary of quality growth stocks that become momentum stocks. What are the warning signs and what are some of the stocks that have fallen into that trap? I mean, I can't pick any stocks for you that are that are in that trap. I mean, I know everyone's talking about like you know Nvidia being the poster child, and you know, I think at one stage I read in the paper it you know got to fifty or sixty times earnings or whatever it was. But markets are forward looking. Now, assuming those forecasts are right, I, I, I haven't done any work on it, so I can't tell you. But if that multiple's right, that doesn't look like a, a bubble unless it's a bubble in earnings. Um, but I think we're we're actually it's not so much now. I think 2021, 2020, 2021, that whole COVID thing. And it's amazing how quickly we forget Bitcoin, Robinhood, mm. um, all these fintechs, Afterpay, all of these businesses that are going to change the world. We own Visa and clients were saying it's a bit of a dinosaur because it's only growing mid-teens. You know, that, that to me was very, very bubbly where valuations completely lost track with reality. Something like PayPal uh, which really essentially only has a wallet, it has no physical, real physical presence, it has no rails. Uh, it was actually had a bigger market cap than MasterCard, which makes no sense whatsoever. So that to me was where things stopped making sense and people are buying stocks because they're going up rather than looking at the valuation of what, what actually is this whole business really worth and what does that imply for future returns. So Despite the mega cap tech run we've seen, you think there is less speculation in the market versus 2021? Oh, much less. Oh, I think so, definitely. I mean, I'm only talking about the big names, right? So um, I can't, you know, maybe there's a whole lot of AI unicorns out there that I'm completely missing. But it it makes sense to me because if you you actually look at, you know, we were in an era of, look, look at the IPO market. That's always such a good place to look. It's dead. Look, look at the merchant. Look at the merchant bankers. Such an old-fashioned word. The investment bankers' bonuses. They they're way down. Investment banks are, are cutting people. Uh, Silicon Valley is letting people go. So I actually think we're in a much better environment than we were two or three years ago. You know, we've got the cost of money to the right place, you know, roughly the right place. Let's say, and I don't know about inflation, but you know, the long bonds are over four percent, and if tips break even rates are right, inflation is going to be two, two and a half percent the next ten years. So I'm getting a real return on my money. That's good. Um, supply chains have healed. That's good. 
Um, you know, I don't. I think we're actually in a much better place with having a proper cost of of money to start with. In your fund materials, you quote Thomas Watson, founder of IBM, who says, "I am no genius. I'm smart in spots, and I stay around those spots." What are Claremont's spots? <laughs> I don't know if you're even smart in places in anyway, I think. <laughs> I think seriously, um, we have the way I look at the portfolio, and if you actually look at our website, it says own the world's best businesses. And there's two key words in there one is own, and the other one is business. We don't trade stocks, we don't trade markets, we literally mentally make that switch in our minds and encourage our clients to do it own businesses. So if we own businesses and we're business owners, You only want to be in those places that you can actually understand, that I can explain simply to myself or to the team or to a client what we do. And that basically boils down to five key areas, or six if you, at the moment, one's not represented in the portfolio. So we love financial plumbing. So whilst we'll never do banks, because we don't like the leverage, the opacity, the regulation, the capital intensity, all of those things, Obviously, financial services is so integral to our whole life. So something like a, a visa is, you know, that's just something we love to be in, financial plumbing. We own a business, you know, CME, the world's largest interest rate futures exchange, completely essential to the functioning of the global economy. That's the space we like to be in. Technology, we've got what I call tech staples, you know, things that are essential to our day-to-day lives, Google, Microsoft, you know, you can't, these are so integral to the way businesses run advertising or businesses run their productivity. We love what we call trusted advisors, things like something like an Aon, uh, where you're, you're integral to a business, you help them make decisions about risk capital, consulting, human capital, all those things, where you become a trusted advisor. We, we like that type of space. We love brands. So we've... Uh, on record, we've owned Nike for a long period of time. Hasn't been our best stock pick so far, but we take a five-year view. Um, Nike, uh, and then the last bucket would be health services. So we don't do anything complicated again there. We don't do pharmaceuticals. We don't do biotech. Anything that requires us to make an estimation of the future, either a phase three drug or a new device or something like that. Uh, Pricing is obviously a big issue as well. And then the last leg that we would own in the portfolio, which we don't, is what we call niche industrials. So we've owned a business like Seeker, which is you know very small part. You know, everything we look for in a business, we're looking for low cost of value. So something like a Seeker could be two to four percent of the total build cost of a building, but absolutely essential to the structural integrity. And that is the only things we'll be in. And the thing I'm always struck by is if we we expect our businesses to focus capital, and we ask them to focus capital on their most profitable businesses. Well, we do the same as well. Are those thematics and sectors actual filters in your process or is that kind of just where the chips land historically? They are a form of filter and that, that are, those are spaces where we feel comfortable looking for businesses. So we don't feel comfortable a whole lot of sectors. We don't, like, we don't feel comfortable in banks or resources or chemi- well, parts of chemicals we like. Uh, but, you know, things that are what I call complicated, regulated, commoditized, just stay well away from. Um, so anything that requires us to make either a, a prediction of the future, so it could be a prediction of an interest rate, a prediction of a commodity price, it could be a prediction of a technology breakthrough, it could be a prediction of a phase three drug or a biotech, it could be a prediction of an election, it's any of those sort of things. Because what I found, and it goes back to your first question, what surprised you? Things always surprise the future is always uncertain. And so when you keep trying to make forecasts of, I think, an inherently unknown future, you actually start making mistakes. And then you have to make another forecast to rectify that mistake and another forecast. And it's really, really tiring, mentally very draining. What's easier is just to sit back and say, you know what? I don't know what's going to happen in the future. And you think about what's happened the last few years. No one saw COVID. Then, the, then, then we were told the economy was going to shrink 20%. I remember that forecast was a good one. It actually grew. Then we were told interest rates were never going to go up till 2024. Uh, actually, they have. Um, inflation was transient. Then it wasn't. Now it's back to soft landing. It just keeps changing all the time. Mm. But actually what never changes is good businesses, sustainable competitive advantage, earning power, and making sure you're disciplined around valuation. The world's most famous high concentration investor would be, of course, Warren Buffett. And he has roughly half of his portfolio tied up in Apple. And Apple just lost almost $300 
billion over a couple of days thanks to China's ban on iPhones. How do you mitigate that kind of risk in such a highly concentrated portfolio? So the first thing I'd say, I mean, it's lost 300 billion, but in the, in the overall picture, what's the market cap of Apple? It's 3 trillion, is it roughly? So it's 10%. So that's not, 10% is not, I know it's a big number, but 10% is not neither here nor there, really. We, you know, if stock prices can bounce all over the place. But we have some kind of clear rules the way we put the portfolio together, because you're right, there is, you're in a concentrated portfolio. So the first thing we do is we, we try and control that risk by business. So when we look at a business, we want the business to be diversified by customer, by product, by geography, by supplier. So if you're a business that's totally reliant on one economic variable, be it an oil price or an interest rate or a US election outcome, or you've got one big customer, we'll just stay away from that because you've now got that real concentration risk, and especially if we're having to make a forecast of the future. So that then trying to buy businesses that are nothing's, for, but that are they have very predictable earning streams. So that's really, really important. And then buying businesses that have very predictable valuation multiples. So we can get a good idea of what the business is actually worth. Because if you get those two things roughly right and the earnings keep growing, that's that's what we're looking for. The second thing is we say no more than 10% of the fund in any one position. Then we say no more than 25% of the fund in any one sector. Um, so that kind of makes sure we don't end up with a, either an, a bias in the portfolio to one type of industry uh, or one, one position. Um, so those are rules. And then we're really, really disciplined on valuation as well. So you can own the best business, but obviously if the valuation is completely wrong, we'll, we'll sell it. I pulled up your fund update from August this year and compared it to August of last year. Alphabet and Nike were top five back then and they're in the top five today. What is it about these kinds of companies that make them top picks in such different markets? So the thing I'd say to that is that markets change. Markets change, headlines change. Um, th there's always a story. There's always a theme du jour, a story. But what we're looking for are businesses that don't change. That, that, and if they are changing, they're changing very, very slowly and for the better. So it's, you know, it's a classic sustainable competitive advantage. So if you look at something like Alphabet, wh wh why did we buy it? We've owned it now for six years. We bought it because they completely dominate um, search advertising, you know, over 90% market share. They have probably the world's biggest treasure trove of data. They have an incredible balance sheet of 120 billion in cash when we bought it. It's still 120 billion. Um, they, you know, they, they have competitive advantages that are really, really hard to compete with. And then the valuation when we bought it was incredibly attractive. Now, over that period, the earnings kept coming through. So obviously the share price is up, but the earnings are up as well. So the valuation hasn't actually changed that much. And all those, it's still got a dominant market share in search. It's still got the balance sheet. It's still got earnings growth. It's not growing as fast as it was, uh, but obviously it's a lot bigger now. But all those competitive advantages are still in place. Um, I think they could have done a better job, if I'm honest, on costs. I think they've been a bit slack there. They could learn a few lessons from another one of our holdings like Microsoft. But those competitive advantages are still there. They still endure. The valuation is still attractive, so it, it's still there. Are these competitive advantages that you're discussing unique to you know, very large cap, mega cap names? In other words, can these advantages exist lower down the market cap yeah, spectrum? No, they can, without a doubt. We, we've, we've owned businesses in the past um, that have been less than 10 billion. So you, you could be just a niche, niche industrial. Um, I think the smallest in the portfolio at the moment is around 17 billion market cap in the big scheme. That's it's quite small, but they're number one in the world in, in what they do. Who so are they? Uh, Steris, okay. so sterilization, medical sterilization business. So what, what you're actually looking for is you, it, it, we don't really look at the size. Um, what we're looking for, and obviously it's, okay, do I want to compete with this business? How, how does this business compete? So you take something like Steris. So they go and sterilize hospitals, pharmaceutical companies, medical devices. So they got the advantages of, of scale, got advantages of trust. Um, they have to, you have to get FDA approval process for a lot of their a lot of the um, business processes, so that's another barrier to entry. Now, if I'm a hospital, I can try and go for the lowest cost provider, but actually how much money am I really going to save 
Uh, and what are the reputational risks if actually I have an outbreak or something like that? That that's something that's really really hard to to compete against. So that and that doesn't change through time. And that's why often the most sort of what I call sexy investments are the most risky, because they they're they're exciting because they're based on a unknowable future. There's going to be a major breakthrough. They take a whole heap of market share. Everyone loves it. But the thing that made it that exciting in the first place then makes it vulnerable mm. because if they were able to take a whole lot of market share with one product, there's going to be someone else just behind them who's going to come with their product. So what we're looking for, businesses, that the reason that the person's buying that doesn't change. It will change very, very slowly. These companies, just looking at your top five holdings, uh, Visa, Nike, Adobe, Alphabet, they have such dominant positions in their markets. Will any of these stocks become forever stocks, so to speak? Yeah, I mean, we ideally buy businesses for forever in the ideal world, but we're not naive enough to think that things change, right? So if I look back to stocks I owned 20 years ago, a portfolio would have been probably 40% consumer staples. You know, that was an era dominated by consumer staples. You know, things like Colgate, Procter & Gamble, Gillette. Um, they were all going global. It was globalisation. There was lots of growth. They had lots of pricing power. Media was completely different then. So all those companies control the airwaves, they control distribution. Now we've got over the top, or what we call over the top, you know, I can come up with a toothpaste brand, I can find people who want to buy it, I can find them on Facebook. So, we, you know, the whole thing has completely changed. And we don't have one consumer staple in the portfolio today. You know, things do change. Um, you can look in technology, you know, IBM was the darling. It's, it's nowhere now. Uh, but if I actually look at, we've specifically chosen, if I look at our tech businesses, We've specifically chosen things where we go, that how, how easy do we think it's going to be for a new entrant to come in? So think about something like Microsoft. Mm. How, and I ask our people at work, how, how easy is it to get that? And said, it's just not happening. It's just too disruptive, too hard. It's just not happening. And so that we, let's say on average you're paying $30 a month, depending on what package you've got, for your Microsoft license. They could charge $50. What am I going to do? I can't get them out. It's Capt just too captured. hard. It's captured. Um, and Microsoft went through a long period of actually quite average management, and they still survived. So that's kind of how, you know, I've asked lots of my friends who are creative people, can you get Adobe out? And they're like, no, can't. It's, it's just fundamental to their whole workflow. So that's the thing we're looking for. To play devil's advocate a bit, we're talking about such high conviction. Can that work against you in the form of a bias? Of course, Totally. Yeah, yeah no, for sure. You become so, overly wed to these positions. Yeah, no, it does. I mean, there well, there's an endowment effect. So obviously, you know, we we all value more what what we currently what we currently own. You know, there's a famous story of when you know when you whenever you put a bet on a horse, everyone just loves that horse that much more. And I always say mm. to the team, I say, guys, beware of your vi your biases both ways. So whenever we own something and something, the share price goes down immediately. We will defend the position instinctively. That's what we do as humans. When we don't own something and the share price goes down, we'll immediately assume the market's right. It's just how, you know, you run away from, from that position. And your, your reaction should be the same. So there is always a danger and you have to test the thesis. So I think the best way to test the thesis is mentally just to say to yourself, if, if I didn't own this stock today, would I buy it today? You know, that's, that's the best way to test something. You know, don't try and get back to break even or say it's cheap or, you know, that kind of thesis. It just like, And we do that from time to time where we make mistakes and then we just say as a team, if we didn't own the stock, would we buy it today? And if the answer is no, it means we haven't got any conviction. So you don't have to make your money back. That stock owes you nothing. So you, can, you don't have to make your money back in the same stock you lost it. Can you give us an example of a high conviction position where you've, as you say, tested the thesis and it's led you to sell? Yeah, um, give you a good one. Uh, booking during COVID. So, I mean, obviously booking, it's terrific business, all the things we look for, um, pretty much dominates that whole, you know, booking experience, especially in, in, in the European markets, which are less dominated by chains. So if I'm a small hotel in Europe and I want to get... To David, who's travelling from Australia, it's going to be really hard for me to, you know, to get to him without using something like like booking. Um, it's got network effects. It's got high thirties margins. Got a great balance sheet. Visit to them. Great management. Really good culture. And we picked it up at a very reasonable valuation. And then COVID hit. 
Um, so then we now either go through the checklist and say, okay, guys, we don't own the stock. Just pretend we don't own it, okay? Just recalibrate our numbers. We said to the analysts, okay, just just run your best case estimate of the numbers. What what do we think the business is earning, you know, in three or five years? And it, it was just really hard for us to get a sense because we had no idea how long COVID would last. So our best guess was three years. It actually turned out to be much less. Um, but we we just didn't know what the outcome would be. Um, I actually think booking is, is a less attractive business now anyway because we don't know if would that happen again. So now we have a new playbook for pandemic. So that theoretically could happen again. Anyway, we, we couldn't so basically we, we couldn't get a we couldn't get an earnings number, so therefore we couldn't get a valuation. So it was a really simple decision to say, well, if we didn't own it, we wouldn't buy it. Okay, and now we've got eight percent of the fund that we can free up um, and we can actually put that somewhere else. What are the, and we actually end up putting it into Microsoft, the bulk of it into Microsoft. Um, and so that was just an easy decision to make. So I think one of the things with investing, it's a kind of a very strange profession because you you have to have the courage of your convictions. So there's a, there's a form, when you buy a company, there's a form of arrogance in it because you're saying I'm right and you're wrong. But then there's also got, it's it's a kind of strange profession because you know you're going to make mistakes as well. So you have to also kind of admit when you've made a mistake. And that's why, you know, I, I rely a lot. Um, Adam and I, my co-portfolio, we rely a lot on the people around us as well. You know, the team and, you know, they will challenge us and say, are you sure you're not in love with this? So that's why I think a portfolio manager with a strong team around them is really, really important because we're all prone to bias, as you said. Given the low turnover nature of your fund, do you think you're as good at the selling as you are at the buying? Um, I, th- I, I genuinely think we're not bad at the selling. I think we've done a reasonable job of it. You know, we've had um, the last six years, we've had a couple of mistakes and we've we've cut the positions and recycled that money. Um, I think in 20, 2021, uh, we sold stocks we loved um, that, that basically the valuation had got very, very stretched and we had to let them go, which was which we, we didn't really want to do. But I think it was vindicated in 2022 where the fund didn't really blow up. I think we aligned with Benchmark. But for a quality growth manager, that was quite a good outcome. Um, I think we've done a, a reasonable job, um, but I agree with you. I mean, selling is the hardest thing to do in funds management because you're either selling something, a mistake, which no one wants to do because you have to admit you made a mistake, or you're selling a winner, which no one really wants to sell a winner. So those are the two big reasons to sell. The third one is obviously you can recycle the money and put it in a, in a better position. A lot of these uh, growth stories, even quality growth stories, tend to come out of the States. Um, do you ever find yourself getting trapped in a US-centric mind, investing mindset? Well, we do have quite a heavy US exposure in the fund. It's, it's not deliberate. It's just how it's just where we end up. But the, the US does have some some big advantages in the sectors that we're, we're interested in. I mean, they have... They have they have some of the best businesses in the world. So they have you know they have great universities and they have great innovation. And if you think of any young person who's in technology, they want to they end up in the states. So you look at look at our our three tech holdings, all run by Indians. You know they they want to be. That's where it's all happening. Um, so they have these natural advantages. Um, if you're a you know if you're a consumer goods business, I'm not that we're we're in that space where we're in we're in Nike and Estee Lauder at the moment, but you know, you have this huge population of what, 350 million people, you can roll it out there. So you get a huge scale advantage from that, which you can then transplant to the to the rest of the world. I think the US does speak kind of, uh, you know, the, the language of business. And when we speak to companies there, we kind of feel like we're on the same sort of wavelength. But it's just the, the way we, we don't actually pick America, we just pick businesses and they end up being, they're there. So we, we go there. Um, uh, what we do find, which is interesting, is actually the European businesses like for like that compete with our US businesses and then we follow, more often than not, will be more expensive than the US. It's just a function of scarcity value. So the US has so many good businesses that often they will trade at quite a reasonable valuation. So I always point this out to people in Australia. People say, Australia is a cheap market. But Australia is a cheap market because it's dominated by banks and resources. 
If you look at Australia's quality growth businesses, the likes of CSL or Cochlear or ResMed, they actually trade quite high multiples re- relative to global peers because there's a scarcity value. Mm. So that's that's something. And I think what's more important is not not where is the business listed, but where where does the business make its money? So if you look at our portfolio in its entirety, only 55% of our revenue actually comes from the States, which is roughly in line with global GDP. So you could say, oh, I'm going to go buy Nestle. Well, Nestle, only I think only 2% of the revenue comes from Switzerland. So I think it's it's not where is the... And, and there are advantages to be in the States as well, States or Europe. There's, you know, there's strong corporate governance, there's strong accounting. I mean, there's always malfeasance and fraud, but it's just really, really well. You know, the governance is strong. You mentioned how the States has this uh, business mindset, this flair for natural flair for innovation. Recently, ChatGPT founder Sam Oldman recently said that Silicon Valley isn't what it used to be. That flair for innovation just isn't there, or at least has died down. Would you disagree with him? Um, I, was, I want to say probably no comment, David, to be honest, because okay. we don't really look at, at the new breakthrough things in Silicon Valley, and we're not. So I don't think we have. Um, we just look at, at the, the businesses that are there today and go, look, look at. We, we, like, I, I didn't buy Google the day it listed. Like I, I'd seen before Google came along, I'd seen Alta Vista, I'd seen Yahoo, Google listed. I thought it looked interesting. I, I mean, I looked at the, the page; it was clean, but I was kind of waiting to see, you know, was their did their lead get to a stage that it was very, very hard to to break into that. So we would never buy something that's just kind of just starting to to make it. There's other people that can do that, and I'm sure Sequoia Capital has done really, really well out of some of those. But I don't. I'm not going to make a big big prediction on that it's just too hard to make well the only thing i would say which i find these big predictions fascinating and i was actually i, I moved um when i moved house a year ago i i, I pulled, had all these books that i had in storage and i actually pulled them all down and i was fascinated that these are books i read 20 25 years ago that all predicted the end of the u.s the end of the world the debt bubble the end of the dollar the debt crisis all, i mean all of this stuff it's what i call bear porn it's mm. just this the stuff that's meant to scare you but the US is still <laughs> bear, bear porn. Bear porn. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like it's just the stuff. It it just gets headlines, right? It's yeah. just headlines, and it's just it's always the and. But actually, I've learned over time. You, you have to try and be an. If you're going to invest, you're investing in businesses. Be an optimist because over the long term, profits go up. Um, as long as you don't pay the wrong price and you buy good businesses, things can work out quite well. So there were all these books I had. They were taking up about half of my bookshelf. And I thought, why did I bother reading all these books predicting the end of the world? I mean, even think of back to the 80s. Japan, it was, it was given. Japan was taking over the states that had it. But it hasn't happened. Even mm. three, four years ago before COVID, China was taking over states that had it. Now we're suddenly talking about, oh, China's, oh, geez, China's, maybe they're, they're in real trouble. And China's the next Japan. There's such big sweeping statements. And history, it's very, very hard to, what, what investors should do, in my opinion, my very humble opinion, is just buy businesses. Buy buy good businesses, buy them at the right price and let those profits grow over time. And when they stop being good businesses, and that sounds a bit glib, well, sell them and put them into the next good business. As a general statement, do you think too many investors sell out of these growth stories too early? It, I've, this is something I've really struggled to, to think. I've thought about it quite a lot. So I think there's, like people often say to me, like, we all have stocks in the fund that w- we sell. And then, you know, five, ten years later, they're, they're much higher. And so, and then I say to them, yes, but at that point in time, you know, the, the business, the market had valued the business at way more than I thought it was worth. So what's, not, what's important is that the, the capital we took out of that stock, mm. where, where have we put it since then? And how's, how's that done? So they, people always look at... How, how did the business, they only look at the one side of the equation. So you could have sold along the way. But I do think generally, if you are in a good position, I think good ideas are so rare. Because good, firstly, good businesses are very rare. They're, they're very rare to find. I mean, all the returns from the S&P 500, there's an academic study, came from 4% of the businesses for start. Then you have to find them at the right valuation, run by honest people. So all of those things have to stack up before you invest in something. Um, so I, I prefer, if we can, not to sell. Uh, be, and you also build up a whole lot of cumulative knowledge. 
Mm. So why why spend some follow you something for years? You buy it and then you sell and you sell because it's gone up thirty percent. Or but sometimes that does happen to us where I look at it and I go, I really don't want to sell this business, but you know what? I really want to buy this business over here, like for like. They're the same quality, but I can pick up thirty percent of valuation over here. Yeah, and that's when you trim. Trim or sell out of a position and recycle the capital. I think. I think what I would say actually, I think the flip side often. I think people sell out of businesses too quickly, on on a negative headline. Mm. What I call jumping at shadows. And I've learned from experience that if you're in a really really good business, don't be too quick to jump at shadows. Um, and I think the best example of that would, would be something like um, like Visa. So I think Visa IPO'd, when was it? Oh, just late 2000s. I think it was around 2008. Um, and I was actually talking to Visa the other day and we were just talking about, you know, they're still in merchant. They've been in merchant litigation since before they IPO'd. Um, and that's, and you know, through that period, I've just read so many people were going to disrupt Visa. It was, first of all, it was going to be the telcos. Then it was going to be Apple Pay. Then it was going to be China Union Pay. Then it was going to be Afterpay, the fintechs. You know, it, there's all the, but actually over that period, the stock's up twenty times. So it's, it, you know, I've never seen a business model like that. When I first saw the company was IPOing, I was just like in awe because they had so many layers of competitive advantage, so many levers they could pull, had so much pricing power. But so if you're in a really good business, don't I, I would say don't jump at shadows and stick the course as long as it doesn't get overpriced those profits of doom though can be very loud very loud have you ever found yourself you know losing your nerve um yeah definitely i mean uh you know i think covid was covid was i was very scared uh well gfc was pretty scary as very scary as well in fact gfc was really scary um but covid was quite scary because you, you didn't you couldn't see an you couldn't kind of see, we hadn't seen it before and you couldn't see an end to it so you you know especially in businesses that were like shut down or under earning we, we just couldn't see an end to it so then you're trying to struggle to find a valuation so i always find valuation is such a good anchor to deal with emotion so you know when we spoke this time last year and i think you said you're about the only positive person i've had on the podcast in the last couple of months i didn't have a crystal ball into how the world would turn out but what i did know is that we had a really terrific businesses in the fund, we were getting amazing opportunities to buy great businesses, but I, I just didn't know when when the value would would come out. Um, so you know, there's been lots of times where I've been very 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 nervous. Um, but the one the easiest ones to deal with where you just have a valuation bubble, like so when when you came to the end of COVID, so December 21, you know I was nervous because valuations were really high. And the Fed was putting up rates, but I kind of the system was sort of working. Mm. But where are you looking at potential? The whole system just breaking down, which was GFC. Like you know, I mean, we were apparently, so I'm told, and read that we were days days away from complete financial Armageddon. And if the central banks hadn't stepped in, the whole thing could have gone. And same thing in COVID. I just didn't know how long that would be. But that is the beauty of owning quality, mm. because if you're in something really really good, you. You, you can it just allows you to sleep better at night you know that the, you know like when covid hit we found all our management teams and just well within a week recalibrated all our earnings models we knew the balance sheets were okay we knew the businesses would survive so that's a good place to be um, and then you know you just have to wait it out until things kind of turn around but if you're in a weak business and bad economy hits you know that could be the the kiss of death um, you know i think warren buffett's got a great saying um, time is the friend of the great business and the enemy of the mediocre. Don't be in mediocre businesses because when something really bad happens, it'll stress you out and then you'll panic and then you'll sell probably at the bottom. So during the GFC, a couple of days before Lehman weekend, uh, you didn't come close to selling out of, you know, maybe especially <laughs> even some financial names. I, I actually got lucky over, over over the GFC. I was just in the point of um, immigrating to Australia, so I had, I'd had to liquidate my whole portfolio anyway before <laughs> it's I left. Convenient. So it was very convenient. So I, I was sitting in cash, but actually, I was so frightened. Um, we I I had been to see one of the big um, major US banks just before COVID, 
And the meeting that I had with them, I came out of that meeting, went back to London and just said, guys, this is really, really, this is really serious. You know, they didn't really mince their words in that meeting. And I was like, wow, these guys are telling me this is Armageddon's coming. And it hadn't really yet. So I was very, very nervous. And I do remember there was a horrible weekend where I think my, my money was sitting in one of the US clearing banks and liquidated uh, my portfolio. And um, I was so scared, I actually just took it completely out of the banking system in totality and just put it into Swiss government bonds, uh, which was totally fortuitous because then Swiss franc rallied really strongly on sort of risk averse trade and government bond prices went through the roof because everyone was so nervous. So it ended up being quite fortuitous for me. But it wasn't by any design whatsoever. So when Armageddon is coming, own quality. It is. It is. Yeah, I think so. Because it, it just it allows you. It allow, you know if I look at our average business, you know the average business is over eighty years old. They they've been around. If I look at our average margin of what we own, it's over thirty percent. We're almost net cash in our balance sheets. At the end of the day, markets prices will go down, but people aren't going to stop using Visa cards. They're not going to stop using Google. Businesses still have to ensure their assets, you know, we're still going to be wearing running shoes. Well, I hope so. Um, and we're still going to have to go to hospitals and they're going to have to be clean. You know, these things don't just go away. The earnings might go down a little bit, but eventually it comes back. And actually, if you look at the history of, of share markets, the, it is a triumph of optimism, mm. you know, over the long term, 9 or 10% per annum. But it, the, trick, the trick is to, is to buy at the right price, to stay, to stay, to stay the course, and that's what quality allows you to do. It allows you to stay the course and not be shocked out when markets are collapsing. And if if you really can, actually buy more because you've been tracking something for years and years and years and years. It's like looking at that property around the corner. You, you've wanted to buy that property around the corner for years. And then suddenly, you know, maybe the, the, the downsizing or whatever it is and people are leaving or there's been a divorce or whatever it is, then suddenly the property becomes available. But people never balk at that. They see that as a massive opportunity. But I find that fascinating because that type of mentality never really seems to transfer to the share market. So people just follow the share price down and they get really negative. Uh, but with properties, you know, like, oh, I've wanted to buy the corner property for years. It's available. And there's a queue of 100 people outside the door. It's a great analogy. Okay, Bob, let's finish with our three favorite questions. Question one, what's one thing investors are getting wrong about markets right now? I don't know how to answer it, to be honest, um, because we just don't think about think about markets and what markets are saying. At the end of the day, the way I always look at it is what what are prices telling us and what is sentiment telling us? So to give you a contrast, if you look back to this time last year when we spoke, prices were telling us that things were really good value, but sentiment was very, very negative. So for us, generally, that's that's an opportunity. Today, prices are not bad, they're fair. But, you know, if I look at our portfolio, you know, it's probably fair value, but, you know, it's, it's not bad or good, it's in the middle of the range. But sentiment's now actually quite positive. So that always makes me a little bit wary because sentiment's moved. Um, like if you, if you say to me, is it possible that inflation isn't transient and the Fed has to go a lot higher? That's possible. Um, is it possible that there's a nasty recession around the corner? That's possible too. Um, but what, what it, what's not necessarily factored in is that margin of safety we're always looking for because the, the future is uncertain. So I can't tell you what markets have got wrong. I just, what I think, just the margin of safety is less because share prices have moved, you know, climbed the wall of worry since August last year. Question two, and I'm going to, rework this a bit in real time if it's all right with you um what's a decision you've made in the past year since we last spoke that was either a good decision or a bad decision what happened and what did you learn from it geez that's a a, a good a quick mm. um well let's t start with the good um i guess a, a good was was topping up on tech last year you know consistently it was ranking at the top of you know we we rank our stocks daily and What's kind of been the, you know, the, and we just look at the valuation. Don't let the narrative affect us. Look at the valuation. Talk to the company. I mean, this, it, it's basic stuff, this. I know it, it sounds really glib, but work out what you think the business is worth in five years. What's the share price today? If that all kind of comes to, to pass, what's the sort of return you can expect to make? 
Um, and consistently, those stocks were ranked at the top of our charts, and so therefore we we were we were adding to them, um, and that's that's worked out well. But we weren't adding to them because of AI. We, we didn't. We, well, AI it's not like it's something new. I mean, the 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 consequence seems to be bigger, and it all's kicked off with ChatGPT. But quite often, I think that what what I take out of that is value can be its own catalyst. So, so when you find something good and it's valuable and at a discount to value, buy it. You don't actually know what the catalyst can be. And sometimes the, the story kind of takes on a life of its own um, and value can be its, its own catalyst is what I'd say. And on the flip side, um, it, an incorrect value can be its own catalyst. So you look back to where we were, like n- not a lot of people. In fact, I didn't read one report that said interest rates in December 21, we're going up 500 basis points. In fact, our own central bank governor told us they weren't going up till 2024. And yet, when that happened, again, something uncertain, valuations had got so extreme in certain places, the consequences of that, you know, destruction of capital is, is, is very bad. Question three, and I feel this question was made for you. If markets were to close tomorrow for five years and you could only own shares in one company, which company would that be and why? And we're not talking valuations or anything. It's just, no, just the just, business model. Yeah, just the business model. Um, I would say probably Microsoft. It's, it's so boring. Everyone knows it. But I, but I look, look at that business and, you know, one of the things we always ask ourselves in five years, in 10 years, in 20 years, can we see a situation where that business won't be there? And I, I find it hard to come up with a scenario where, Chief technology officers aren't buying Microsoft because the the network effect is so strong. So now you'd have to, I don't know how many, but you think how many, six, seven billion people, most people in the world use email, they use Excel, they use Word. It's all on top of their laptop. The CTOs of every business have this plugged in. Now they're plugged in even more. They're in the cloud. They got our data. They're just completely plugged into every business. So to, to take that out and replace it with something new Seems to me hard to envisage, but that, you know, I could never, I could never imagine, you know, if you'd said to me twenty years ago that um, you know, we wouldn't, you know, I just never saw how media would change. Mm. So nothing's forever, but as it stands today, mm-hmm. I just, when I think about it, I just go, you, how, do, how do you get them out? They could charge me fifty dollars, a hundred dollars. What, what am I going to do? What do I replace them with? That, so that would probably be in terms of a business model. When I look at the portfolio, and, and that's interesting because people say our oh, technology is fast changing, but I think not all technology is fast changing. So if you're just, what we're looking for is technology where just at the margin, you're always making it a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better. I mean, obviously cloud's been quite a big innovation. So that, to me, I look at that business and go, that's if, you know, and I think Warren Buffett's got a great saying, you know, if, I, if you gave me a billion dollars or whatever it was when he wrote the articles years ago, would I want to compete with that business? You know, if I gave you $100 billion, do you think you could recreate Microsoft? It'd be really difficult because you'd have to go to every business, every individual and say, rip that off, mm-hmm. learn this new system, learn, it's just too hard. Bob, this has been another fantastic chat. Let's do it all again in a year. Thanks, David, good to see you. Thanks for tuning into this episode with Claremont Global's Bob Desmond. Thanks also to Bell Direct for their support of this podcast. And remember, for a limited time, you can get three Bell Potter stock reports each week and you'll go into the draw to win a share of 3 million Velocity Frequent Flyer points. So go to Bell Direct, check the full terms and conditions and look for the Livewire logo to get your Bell Potter stock reports now. Competition ends 31st October 2023. Entry conditions and eligibility criteria apply. New South Wales Authority number TP forward slash 02866. South Australia Permit number T23 forward slash 123. ACT Permit number TP23 forward slash 01592.